So this project is you, um, from the designs we saw, you are going to be fitting um, posts and the cable system on top of trapezoidal roof, um, which is a metal skin with raised profiles built on top of insulation and on top of a liner sheet and to a, to a specification, yes? Yes, right here. Yeah. Great. Okay, so this presentation, I've narrowed it down to only cover those products. So, this is the anchor that you will be fitting. This product is called the Spirotech. And on my screen, this part of the Spirotech, which you should be able to see my mouth, mouse moving around, is the shock absorber that is designed for ends and corners only. So this is a big shock absorber that when you fall absorbs more energy. And then for the intermediate posts, which are placed every 10 to 12 meters, you have a much smaller shock absorbing post. Okay? Okay. Now, how you tell one from the other is normally this case is obviously silver, aluminium. And here you see this little mark. It says two people there. The intermediate post will have one person and it's a much smaller, lighter unit. Now, all of these assemblies come apart. So, this product conceptually is modular. So, essentially, the picture here illustrates for a uh, membrane roof, so it has a special hat. So, the membrane can be welded here. And the part inside is a can which screws onto a base plate here and this base plate is designed to fit lots of different types of roofs so it has big holes and alignment of small holes for rivets and also for um, fixing to standing seam roofs but this shock absorber here the end and corner shock absorber is multi-directional it'll activate in that way that way any direction that a person may fall so you don't have to align it in a particular direction it's designed to ensure the integrity of the roof you will know i've no doubt that a typical metal roof is designed to absorb energy of around one kilonewton per meter square above much more above that and what can happen is when the load is placed on the roof is it can pull the roof off its fastness. So the anchor may stay on the roof, but the roof doesn't stay on the building. So this roof system is designed to stop that from happening. It's made from high grade materials. It's made from a high grade marine alloy. So it has a very long life and high performance and reliability. And you can use it, as is illustrated here, as a single point anchor. So you can put one in one place without a cable and attach a lanyard to this point here. Okay. As it says here, it can be, it's designed to fit most types of roofs, and we've tested on many, many types. It should be easy and quick to install. It's environmental friendly and prevents what we call thermal bridging. And by thermal bridging, what we mean is the fixings do not penetrate from the outer sheet through the inner sheet to the building. So it's good for stopping leaks. Okay. So this here shows uh, a typical test. So in the middle, you'll see here a end corner anchor. And on this chain is 200 kilos being dropped four meters. So you'll see what happens there is the anchor actually pulls away and you'll see inside this anchor is what we call a timber pit, which is a weak part of metal that splits open and allows the can to displace. So it's really important for you guys when you're fitting this 
that you do not over torque the anchor because if you over torque the anchor it splits this timber pin and activates the anchor so i will tell you what torque settings to use and it's also in the instructions the installer instructions and it's really important that you properly torque set the anchor okay okay so we'd normally say at this stage that it's really important guys to do a proper survey and make sure you know exactly what the alignment of the holes on the roof are that the roof is um appropriately strong to take this kind of anchor installation and that you're designing the system typically for three people or less in any one system and that's for both safety and structural reasons if you can imagine on a lifeline you have one guy falling and then another guy falling then they'll slide together on the line and that can actually cause problems so you normally advise the customer to say look try to keep one person per span two can work safely but any more than two and it becomes a real risk so we normally say we propose um rams which in in our um, area is risk assessment and method statement so we tell the customer exactly what the risks are um, and how that those risks have been reduced by our system okay this shows a, a closer up load test um, to illustrate exactly in slow motion what happens so you can see this is properly this is properly torque set a load is attached to the cable system and dropped and this one is on what we call a bitumen roof very common in western europe and what you'll see is this can split away so this point here is where the timber pin joins and underneath this can here is where you would torque set it so you can see if you put a wrench here and a wrench here and twist them how you would split that timber pin okay so these are the plates um your plates will be ordered i think if you haven't ordered already will be this kind of plate and essentially you have a series of holes and these holes are designed to orientate that way and this way to the most common types of roof profile it may be you have this one here uh, again this can be used on common types of roof profile and you will typically have two rivets per corner so two here two here two here and two here and you align those holes with the upstand on the roof so this is the raised part so we rivet those holes to the raised part of the roof. And that's what this indicates here. We use the word pitch. This is the distance between the raised part of the roof and the next raised part of the roof. So you can see here that this base plate here, 405, 405, aligns with all these different pitches. So it's different size roofs. So you would turn it round in that orientation or this orientation to suit that pitch. Does that make sense, gents? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay, uh, this one's a little bit irrelevant for you because this is about toggle fixing. These are using these big holes here. Um, but it might be of interest to you for future projects where you have a roof that has a metal deck, then insulation, and then a soft outer skin, typically a UVPC or a EPDM or a bitumen. And we use a long toggle that goes through the bitumen or the PVC to the metal deck on this type of the using these holes. This plate here is a basically the same plate with no holes and because it's relatively soft aluminium 
you can drill these on site using a template to rivet to. So if you're unsure of the dimensions where the holes are, or you want flexibility to put it where you need to put it, then you order these plates, these blank plates. But bear in mind, 405, 405 is, is the dimension from here to here. And obviously the holes have to be inside that dimension. Okay, so the anchor you're actually going to fit is going to look like this. This is a trapezoidal roof, and the pitch, as I described, is from this point to this point. And then we call the point from here to here, this whole width of an individual sheet, we call that the cover width. Okay? So if you ever need to talk or seek advice from us on how to fix, you we call this the pitch, and these are crowns, and this is the cover or the roof sheet width. So a typical roof would look like this, where very commonly in Europe the dimension <coughs> is three 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 from there to there, and the cover width of a whole sheet, this is just a, a, a small section would be around one meter. Okay, so we will be fixing to this sheet using this type of rivet. This is a 7.7 .7 rivet, and it'll be inserted into the um, top of this roof crown with sufficient width to allow this to bowl underneath this part. So we drill the hole into the roof, we place the rivet in, we rivet it, and this butyle seal then seals up against the underside, sorry, the top side of the plate and creates a watertight seal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, what will happen? Uh, I have a question. What yes. will happen if the roof doesn't have enough strength? If the roof doesn't have a lot of strength, um, well, the, the, the big question is, if it can't take one kilonewton per meter squared, then really you should not walk on it, because one kilonewton is equivalent to a, a, a large human. So it, it doesn't have to be very strong. We fitted on composite roofs where this outer sheet here is just over 0.5 millimeters thick. So it doesn't have to be very strong. It just has to take more than one kilometer per meter. That, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know of many metal roofs, if properly built, you know, apart from maybe like a farm building or, or somewhere where somebody's just laid the corrugated sheet on top that are yeah. not capable of taking those loads. So a properly built building rather than something home built. Now, if you are unsure, what you can do for the customer is you can take just this base plate here, attach an eye as opposed to this module and conduct a pull test using something like a turfer winch or a chain hoist. And you yeah. can then ask us to validate some of that information for you. We can't fully validate it, but we can advise you. Okay, fine. Yeah, okay. Okay, next here we illustrate really, which is part of the sales advantage of this kind of system, uh, what we call thermal bridging. So traditionally, people have taken a big metal box section or tube and cut a hole in the roof and gone right through the roof with this tube down to the steel structure. Um, the advantage of that is, of course, that it's very strong or can be very strong. The disadvantage is that you have to position these solid anchors only where there is solid steel structure below, which means it might not be in the place where you need it for full protection. And also, it then creates a big potential for leak because you have this big hole in the roof that you have to seal 
plus it allows any energy, um, either heat or cold from in the building, to thermally bridge and transmit outside the building. So it's very inefficient. Whereas the Spirotech top fix anchors, as you can see here from the thermal signature, only emits a very small amount of energy. And with the type of anchor fix you're doing with rivets, it's, it's absolutely tiny because we're only penetrating the top sheet. This example is showing toggle fix, which actually goes through both sheets with an eight millimeter. Okay, so we've discussed the posts here, so now we'll look at the components. So every system starts with one of these, an eye and pin, and that eye enables you to attach either a tensioner unit or a swage toggle. So a tensioner typically is at one end and the swage toggle is at the far end. And the tensioner allows you to apply a 0.8 kilonewton tension to the cable. And it's fixed to the top of the post using this system iron pin. And you can see here, there's a little split pin. And there's these two plastic keepers that, which stops it moving around. And that's torque set to the top of an end corner anchor. From there, we go on 12 meters typically, and we have an intermediate anchor. And the intermediate anchor should be positioned that this part faces the outside of the building so that the traveler, sorry, this part, I had my mouse on the wrong place, faces the outside of the building so the traveler can smoothly run through here. So the eight millimeter seven by seven cable is threaded through this tube. Make sense, gents? Yeah. Great. At every 90 degree corner, and if I remember rightly on this building, you have only 90 degree corners, then you would fix one of these to the top of an end corner. And the eight mil cable is threaded through here and the unit is fixed to the top of the end corner post. So it would typically go from here to here, uh, maybe three or four of these, you know, 30, 40 meters, and then to the corner, and then off at a right angle of 90 degrees to some more of these before finishing at an end. If you need to deviate the cable to go round air conditioning units or to go over the top of the ridge of the roof or maybe down to a valley in a roof then you use this anchor and this anchor um, is what we call a variable and this variable anchor these tubes can be bent on site by up to 23.5 degrees so you can bend them in in any direction up down left or right but you must <clears throat> excuse me you must only bend them sorry 22.5 degrees you must only bend them with the cable inside because if you bend it without the cable you won't get the cable in okay if you need to deviate the cable by less than 90 so say 45 degrees then obviously you use a 45 degree and that, like this one, that, like this one, is a fixed unit. Now, this unit, the hex swage joiner, is for two reasons. If you have, for example, uh, a very long system, so, for example, we did an airport in the Middle East with a kilometer of cable. Well, trying to carry a kilometer of cable is really hard. So what we did is break the system into smaller chunks and use this hex wage joiner to then join the cables together in the mid span. It's always useful to have one of these in case you make a mistake whilst tensioning as well and you end up having to cut the cable because this enables you to join the cable together. 
in a, in a you know if you make an error. You follow me so far, gents? So did you hear me talk about this? Yeah, the, the first picture on the top left. The, uh, okay, this one. Yeah, top left. Okay, so this one between here is 12 meters. This is 90 degrees, yes? Yeah. And this one, this variable is for going over ridges, crossing valleys, and for changes in direction of 22.5 degrees. You bend this on site using a pipe bender, but you must do it only with a cable inside. Okay. Yes? The 22 degree in vertical plane. Um, yeah, it'll work in the vertical, obviously, from this point here, up like that, 22.5, 22.5, or in the horizontal plane, any axis. Okay. So you bend it using the tool gradually here. Yeah. Okay. So it's good for things, you know, sometimes you have um, a raised um, skylight or an aircon unit and you need to deviate the cable between posts. This is good for that or for crossing the ridge of the roof where, you know, the ridge of the roof is five degrees up and five degrees down on the other side. So you need to kind of join the cable in a big V. Okay. Okay, and this one I think I told you, um, this is called a joiner. Now, it's always worth having these because this helps you if you make a mistake and need to cut the cable. And if you're doing very long systems, so you don't need to carry, you know, a big drum of cable onto the roof because, you know, 500 meter drum of cable is really heavy and it's difficult to carry. Yeah. So I would always advise any installer, if they can, to have a couple of those with them. Okay, I can see viewer two asked, what is the distance between the intermediate and the end corner? The maximum distance between any two posts is 12 meters. 12 meters. Okay. 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 So these components attach, the, the components on the left attach to the components on the preceding page. So you have here the tensioner, and this is. 0.8 kilonewtons, and when you reach the right tension, the disc here becomes free to spin. I'll show you a unit um, in my hand, so I can uh, show you how it how it works. Okay, but it's a very simple device, and essentially in here we have the long threaded bars here and here. We have a hole here, and before you start, you'll need to extend these bars out so that you can then turn the buckle here to apply the tension. Does that make sense? So this unit attaches to this, that, to this. Okay? Okay. And the critical, this is just an alternative. Um, I don't think you've ordered this one. It's the same, but slightly different version. So ignore this one. 
So when guys are first installing systems, this is the bit that they make mistakes on sometimes. Because we pull the cable through the whole system, we insert the cable into this part yeah. to swage, and we have to measure it pretty closely to make sure it's of the right length. Otherwise, when we turn the buckle to tension it, we find we can't get enough tension uh, and there's too much cable. And sometimes that requires us to cut the cable, which is why this thing is useful. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. On the other end of the cable, then, you would have this, the hex swage toggle. So this part is really similar to this part. And this part is near, very, very similar. It's the pin that goes on to this. So essentially, we take that out and we insert that. So the interesting thing when we're doing this is we start where we finish. <laughs> so we normally stage this onto the end of the cable. And we thread the cable through these and these and these where they are all the way to the end. And we finish here. So now we've pulled the cable through and it's tight as it's gone through the intermediates on top of the post. And we will hold the cable at the intermediate here with a clamp. And I, if you don't have a clamp, it's on the tool list that I think we've sent you, then you can use what we call vice grips or mole grips to hold the cable in place. That then means the only tension you're applying between the intermediate and the end is a 12 meter span. So you can measure more accurately rather than trying to prove 150 meters of cable. Enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Brilliant. Over here are the two types of traveler. I believe the one we, we've specified is the simple one, and this is the one we sell much, much more of. 90% um, of the sales of this are the Unigrab. So this is removable from the system. So it's locked into place with the carabiner, which basically, when you slide the unit apart, it opens up like a clamshell. Um, so the gap's wide enough to take from the cable and then when you close it, you put the carabiner with two, through two holes. It's really important to remember that only this carabiner works. This carabiner specifically. Because the dimensions of that cable, uh, sorry, carabiner to this hole are critical. With this unit, which is the more sophisticated and expensive unit, this travels a little bit freer. But most importantly, this part swivels to allow you to work on both sides of the cable um, without any interruption. But in, I, I'd say in 95, even more roof systems, people buy this one. Yes. It's perfectly, perfectly good. Okay. So this shows the anchors. So as I said earlier, the ends and corners, which are the more expensive anchors, they have exactly the same base plates. So these base plates are the same, and they screw in exactly the same way. This one we call the tip over, which is the intermediate post. And obviously, it's not as capable of absorbing energy as this post, but it is still vulnerable if you over torque it. So it's important not to over talk. Um, if in the event you know you have a problem with an anchor, then this part of the post is separate from this. You can order you order these separately, these modules. Okay. Okay. So as it says here, 
suitable for two users, ends, corners, sorry, ends, corners, and across the roof apex using a variable intermediate. Okay, so this would be a typical layout that, that we would do in many on many buildings. And this is a trapezoidal roof. So you can see that's your roof pitch. A cover would typically be that sort of cover. And it shows here 12 meters between that post and that. So this is an end corner start. So there'll be a tensioner here. There'll be a system iron pin here. And we go 12 meters to an intermediate. So that would be that post there. And that post, the A, would be that post. Yes. Okay. And then we go to B, which is a corner. And not guys, how it's positioned. The post is in alignment with the other post. But the cable is offset by the bracket. Do you see how it's all brought into alignment? So the corner post would be, again, one of these type. So then this is a variable. So here, the variable would be an end corner anchor with this on top bent in plane or that plane to go up and over the ridge do you see so you can work this out on site just by looking down the line and then bending the angle of the intermediate the variable intermediate till it lines up with this one does that make sense guys Yeah, everybody follow me so far? Yeah. So in this case, we are using 11 uh, base plates. You're using 11 base plates altogether? We have 17 base plates. OK. Yeah. I mean, I can't remember on this project whether you cross ridges. I'm not sure. Okay, it also illustrates the proximity here to the ball hazard. And then here, guys, is something unique. Um, if you need a little system to come off the system, you put an end post here. And then we have something called a throw plate. And the throw plate is a small attachment that goes on top of the post and allows you to put an intermediate for this line and an end eye here. So that it means that you don't have to buy two posts. Okay? okay. Over here then, and again, same rules apply. 12 meter maximum. There is no minimum, but 12 meter maximum and 12 meter here, uh, sorry, 12 meter here again. And then here we have either a variable or in this case, it looks like a 45 degree angle and then to the end. So at this end would be the toggle. Okay. So in process of fitting, you would start this end, you would place, you would swage this onto the end of the cable, attach it to here using that, then pull the cable through, put it through all the intermediates, the corners, etc. And then when you're at this end, you would align it with this swage and mark this swage unit so that you have 
no more than a centimetre or two slack in the 12 metre span so that when you swage the cable and you apply the tension, it tensions the whole system. I'm going to try and show you how that's done. Okay, something else you have to be aware of is if you put the system near to the end on this type of roof and it's a ridge system, then there's potential for this. So what we would normally do is put single point anchors here and here so that the guy can stop swinging into, you know, onto the ground. We call that a swing fall. Okay. So this basically now shows you some torque settings. The critical torque settings for you are these. You must torque set these because it's very common for guys not to do that. And when they do, when they fail to do that, they split the timber pin and they need to order a new, um, a, a new post. So that torque setting is preset. Okay. At the ends of each system, oh, I was going to show you. Sorry, I was trying to illustrate on the wrong picture there. Just here. So these are the critical ones. And then the underside of there. Okay. Yeah. This is your system tag, which should be positioned one at the end of each system. Um, you needn't worry about this. This is for an RFID tag, um, a radio frequency tag, which, I mean, if you want to use them or you can get them, then, you know, feel free. But it indicates to the user that the system's safe, has been properly installed and inspected, uh, and gives them a reference. And our guidance is that these anchors are inspected by you every year. So, again, from a business perspective, it's it's good to make sure the customer knows that the we as the manufacturer state it should be inspected every year, um, and it gives them the reassurance that the system is correct. And when you're inspecting the systems, you would normally check tension, and you would check the torque settings and the general condition. And normally you would wipe the components, you know, as you do with any metal device, just to make sure they're free from corrosion, etc. And to help you do that, we provide uh, a checklist. Um, I don't know if Remain's given you access to our, our resource center, but the resource center has all this information on. So you can download this check checklist. Um, and it gives you guidance so that the guys don't forget things to check. It also works as a good reference while you're installing as well. Okay, so on to some tools then. So one of the uh, main tools you'll need is uh, a swager. Now the swager we recommend is from a Japanese company called Zumi and it's called an EP410. And it has these specific jaws inside here, which can be replaced. And we use this to attach the tensioner and the swage on either end. Okay. Now, once a swage has been attached properly with six continuous bytes on the swage cable. It gives you a strength of 38 kilonewtons. And our system has been designed with a maximum load of no more than 19 kilonewtons. So we have got a factor of 10. Now, normally in Europe at the moment, we test each swage using um, uh, quite an expensive testing appliance up to 10 kilonewtons. But we found now over a period of time that the need to do this test is, is not there um, because they're just never failing. 
So we would advise you to do a visual tactile test. So we've withdrawn the need for this which saves you some money on test equipment. Okay, so critical things to remember are, those are the swage dies you need for one of these, and Izumi are pretty international. They're available um, all over the place. Um, I know that we sell them from the Middle East, and we also sell them from our Singapore office. But actually, it's better to get in touch with the Zoomi themselves. Okay, so this six continuous bytes it's referring to is bytes along the hollow metal tube of the tensioner and the swage. So let me show you what I mean. So along this part, only a proportion of that is hollow. So we advise you to put the cable in and then mark with a pen so you know where it's hollow. And then when you bite swage it, you bite in six continuous bites, leaving around one millimeter gap. So that applies to this and to that. Okay, the next tool you'll need is Either this is a hand riveter, so essentially it has a jaw here for the rivets, and you push the rivet in by hand, and I'm going to show you a little video of this, and then you hand operate this, it collects the remaining part of the uh, rivet in this keeper here. Or you can have a powered version. Now, if this job that you've got is only 17 posts, then, and for reliability, I would say this one is perfectly sufficient. This one you would invest in, really, if you're doing lots of these type of installations, because these are, um, you know, they're batteries, so really you need a couple of batteries as well. And like all battery tools, they run out of power when you least want them to. And then, of course, you need a torque wrench. And the torque wrench, you need to buy these heads um, from us because these are very specific to some of our equipment. And you need a torque wrench with a range of 0 to 60 Newton meters. So those are the essential tools required. That, that, I would say this one, the Gisipa, and a torque wrench. Okay. Uh, a question. Do you provide all these tools with this, with this equipment? This is. Yeah, we all these tools are available from us. Yes, um, and they yeah they're on the, the price list, but they're also available. They are pretty standard. These these Jasipa um, rivet guns are really very very common. Yeah. So we don't make these. We we buy them, stock them, and then sell them to the installers. And we don't make this. This is made by Azumi. This, the only things that are specific to us are these heads. But again, some of those can be got. Um, you know, if you have a torque wrench that fits these bolts, then that's fine. Do you follow me? Yeah. Great. Okay. okay, so this is a short video we, we did yesterday to try and show you how the oh, sorry, rivet process takes place. So excuse any strange noises in the background there we go so that's the base plate and you can see how the holes align here with this center they've got to align in the center to allow the rivet enough room underneath so now he's drilling the hole right through the top of the crown 
And the sheet that he's actually fixing to here is only 0.6 of a millimetre thick. And it's bonded with, um, it's a composite sheet. So there's nothing else holding that sheet on other than really glue and a couple of tech screws. So the gentleman who asked the question earlier about, you know, how weak is the roof or how strong does it have to be? This tells you. Now, normally guys, I'll, I'll, there's a slight error in this video. You would now brush off all of that swarf, all of the drilled material and collect it off the roof. A really common mistake is guys leaving that that debris, um, that swarf, and that swarf will then corrode and stain the roof. So really important that the installers take all of that away. So you know like these little car vacuums, they're quite good for that. Yep. Yeah. Hello, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Did everyone hear that? Really important because I don't want your customer to be phoning you and saying, hey, you know, there's loads of brown marks on my roof. Okay. So you'll see how the rivet works. He's using, he's using the hand riveter. So you can see it's pretty efficient and quick. Um, and of course, you would, you must pick up all of these as because again all these things end up in the gutter or, or or staining the roof so occasionally what happens gents is just if we I don't know if I can scroll that back there what what happens sometimes I don't know how familiar you are with riveting is the rivet um, sticks a little bit and when it sticks, all you have to do with this Jeepa gun is pump it so that the jaws come forward, and it's normally a small part of the rivet is sheared off and stuck in the jaw. So you just pump it so the jaws are open, and then you can prise out the part that's stuck. Um, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, but it's something you need to check. Yeah. Okay.